Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this online seminar organized by CIMNE in the framework of the European label of the Human Resources Strategy for Researchers. With the aim of, inf of informing about various aspects related to research, uh, ranging from management of human resources to the best training of researchers in different fields. This is the second meeting of three uh, that make up the cycle. And our aim is to show the work that is being done in relation with, uh, with the research career of uh, CIMNE staff, providing resources and experiences that can serve as an inspiration for researchers. Uh, we begin with the seminar, but not before reminding you that in the framework of the development of this project, different specific actions have been developed about which uh, you can obtain information at the CIMNE website. This plan includes various measures of great interest for, uh, for, for you all. So we encourage you to come and consult this, uh, this information at, at, the, at the website of, of the initiative. Uh, this seminar will last about uh, one hour and a half. At the, and at the end, uh, there will be a question and answer session. So you can send uh, the questions through, uh, through the tool that we have here in Zoom. And, uh, or you can raise your hand. As, uh, as as you want. Um, at the end of the meeting, you will also receive a link uh, to complete a short survey um, so that we can uh, obtain uh, a feedback, which is precious for us uh, regarding this type of, of actions. So we now give, a, give the floor to Pedro Diez, uh, who is the CIMNE Scientific Director. Go ahead. Pedro, I think you can you can talk now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I'm trying to share my, share my screen now. Uh, I believe that it is working now, right? right? Yeah, it's working right now, Pedro. Okay, so, so this presentation is a very short presentation uh, intending to describe what would be a, an academic career at Thibne from, so to speak, the, the, the more uh, junior researchers to the more senior researchers. Of course, this doesn't mean that uh, you have to do everything at Thimne from the start to the end. So this is just describing somebody that would be there, but that's not uh, the, the, the objective eh, to, 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 to make the full progress in Thimne. So you can enter or exit at any point of, of, of this uh, career. But it is what uh, we typically use to describe the different levels of uh, expertise and, and categories that uh, we will find in any uh, scientific um, scientific organization as as uh, So, so what I'm showing now is the actually something which is uh, pending of uh, final approval by the governing council of Thimne, which is the. A, a new structure of uh... Pedro. One one remark. Um, you can shift to the presenter mode because we are watching also the notes. Huh? So maybe you can. Yeah, let me check that because probably um, I, I let me stop sharing and restart because I okay I shared the wrong the wrong um, no problem. Uh, yeah, exactly. I shared the, the wrong. Uh, screen because I have two and uh, yeah okay let me see if this works better now it is okay now okay perfect Pedro thanks thank you <laughs> thank you because thank you Luis because that's uh, always you don't realize that the, the screen you are sharing when you share the screen that uh, you, having two as I have here okay so thank you so the the, the idea uh um I, I think I will take this out. Um, the idea is that uh, we approve this, uh, or we didn't approve, but we propose that, and it's still pending of a formal approval. But uh, approval, but this is actually what 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 we are going to adopt as a career for the academic path, and we have also an innovation path for people who are researchers, but not most devoted to innovation and technology transfer. So I'm going to describe today. Uh, sorry. I'm going to describe today just the more standard academic uh, path, which was already set up in, in the past. And as, as you see, it's going to keep uh, ongoing in the future. 
is is the the academic path on after the the postdoc after you you get your your phd thesis as a first postdoc then assistant research professor then associate research professor and then finally as a full professor so but this is just to, to you to have the the big picture of what is going to happen in the next future having also the innovation path which i'm not going to describe to in the academic path and this is already a, an old slide that was described in the in the past exactly as it is going to be in the future we had the training positions master and phd student the what we call tenure track positions as, as postdoctoral researchers and assistant research professor and then the tenure positions in which uh, uh, we include both associate research professor and full research professor. And this is exactly, uh, if I, I zoom in to the, to the previous uh, uh, figure that I showed before, uh, these are exactly the categories uh, I was showing before. And we can see that here that there are inside each academic category, there are different contractual subcategories depending on the on the maturity of the person and depending on many factors but so i'm going to describe just the academic level and not the contractual level and so and, and there will be not a mismatching but it's a more a, a richer description in terms of contractual position so you, you may have different contractual positions for each academic level but i'm not entering into that just, just to and what I'm going to describe a little bit in more detail is how to progress in this uh, academic uh, career. So I'm not going to discuss what happens uh, from PhD uh, to postdoctoral because this is, uh, or from master to PhD, of course, that's something that it is uh, more or less just an academic exercise of uh, how do you obtain your, your PhD degree. But then once you enter into the postdoctoral phase, we uh, conceive here uh, a period of at the most four years in which you may have a first evaluation just to assess your progress and to uh, guarantee that you keep on going with your research. Then a second evaluation that allows you to uh, jump into the next step, which is assistant research professor. Again, uh, uh, after three years of first evaluation in which uh, you are assessed if, if you are in the good track or not, and then a second evaluation in which you jump into the associate professor, or if you are not uh, properly assessed, if your assessment is negative, then you have to leave the tenure track. Uh, then after you get into the tenure uh, period, so in, in the period in which uh, you uh, you become either an associate or, uh, or research professor, then uh, you have a still a four year uh, evaluation in which uh, you are as uh, you, you are assessed in terms of your uh, performance as, as a researcher and then even if you are senior of course you may have a negative assessment and then the, the center should have some measures in order to correct this negative assessment in both the associate research professor and the full research professor uh, I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, in the two first uh, tenure track uh, positions, there is a, a way, which is the fast track, in which if your first evaluation is very good, then you may jump directly into the next step. And that's what we call fast track. So a brilliant postdoctoral researcher, such that after two years, has merely all the merits or all the all the indicators that allow him or her to jump into the next step, uh, we may uh, recommend uh, a center to uh, uh, to make him uh, or her pass into the next uh, into the next uh, step. So, uh, so this is a little bit the thing. Eh? We call it, as I said, in the two phases: tenure track and tenure. Tenure, in the sense that uh, if everything goes well you are guaranteed to keep on uh, Thimlin. That, that's, uh, that's a little bit the message. Huh? And uh, this is a little bit uh, the orientative uh, estimated time scales and age uh, for the 
scientists uh, in order to track this career. So that's important because uh, at the end of the, the day, uh, as I said before, you are not supposed to do all your career in Thymne. Actually, you are supposed not to do all your career in Thymne. So you're supposed to start then go away, come back and be incorporated in, in any of the stages. And then it's important to have an orientation of uh, what would be the standard merits, but also the standard ages and years in which uh, uh, you may you may be in each of the categories. Of course, there are many exceptions to that. Eh? So that, that's not uh, aging. And that's something that as an orientation for somebody that has a, a standard career with no delays due to anything or with not accelerations due to any factors. Eh? But that's just an estimation or an orientation. Okay, so this is now a set of slides which are all very similar. But uh, the only thing that are supposed to do is that to make also uh, some orientative uh, criteria to uh, to describe what are the the performance uh, that we assume that should be um, uh, demanded in every of the stages in order to go from one of the steps to the other. So you will see that the items are always the same. So papers. Uh, research uh, uh, proposals that you that you uh, submit and that you get accepted, um, participations in the proposals, participations in conferences and meetings, uh, software uh, that uh, you you pr produce, uh, involving in other type of activities, and then other merits. Of course, the, the items are always the same in all the stages. So what changes, of course, is the intensity of the quantity of production in each of these items. OK, uh, this is something that, uh, that uh, I, I indicated in the, in the right top corner on the, on the graph at which level it uh, corresponds. So this is in the first evaluation. And, and uh, we didn't put any numeric uh, assessment of the number of papers, for instance. Why? Because we typically refer to the equivalent categories in uh, other institutions like in the university, or the equivalent uh, categories that are in, in Araur or in any of the quality agencies. And in particular, because we adhere to this uh, new uh, spirit of assessing uh, individuals, not by metrics, not by uh, bibliometric uh, numbers, but by a more, uh, say, comprehensive evaluation. In particular, if even if we say that here we will ask uh, to have seven, 10 papers, uh, even if we say that, uh, it's not the same having seven, seven papers with uh, one author and top journal that have in seven papers with 10 authors each and in uh, not top journal. So, so that's something that uh, has, to be, has to be assessed by a commission and the commission takes into account not only the quantity, but also the quality and not only the quality, but also the pertinence to the type of research that we do in Thibault. So then, as I said, all the next slides are going to be a little bit repetitive because uh, what we are going to see is changing this uh, small red arrow. So of course, if you go in the fast track, of course, the, the, the criteria are more exigent. So they do correspond to actually the second evaluation or, or, or closely. And then as, as, as you see here, to jump into the assistant research professor, you need having uh, an equivalence to the criteria required uh, to be uh, the Spanish figure of uh, Professor Contratado Doctor or, or Professor Doctor in, in, in the Catalan system, which are equivalent. So at the end of the day, you, you are assessed in terms of the same items, but uh, with um, different levels. And of course, in order to get in the fast track, you need to be better than in order to uh, better assess than in order to, to just keep for the second part of the uh, postdoctoral uh, term. Then uh, at the end of the postdoctoral res uh, researcher uh, 
path uh, you are just uh, going assessed again. And then, of course, if uh, in this particular case, you are not fulfilling the, the criteria to jump into the assistant research professor, which are, broadly speaking, the same as, as, as uh, Professor Lacto, but of course, since you are not supposed to provide any teaching load, uh, we are going to be a little bit more exigent. Because we know that some of you, they do produce teaching, and that's, of course, uh, also taken into account, even if they are just a team of research. Uh, of course, in this particular case, and regretfully, uh, the candidates which do not fulfill the, the requirements must leave the, the team. Then uh, again, uh, so, so everything is, 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 is really similar. Uh, once you are in the assistant research professor part, you are just judged by the same type of items. But here, for instance, you are always you are, uh, asked to also have participated in the supervisions of PhD and master thesis. Uh, maybe you have some teaching activity and that is not necessary, but it is positively um, assessed uh, or appreciated. Uh, again, uh, uh, here I, I put together both the, the fast track and the second evaluation because they do both coincide in terms of uh, in terms of requirements, as it is normal. Huh? So, so you jump the second phase if you are able to fulfill the criteria that uh, you are supposed to have at the end, but uh, you, you have them two years before, right? So again, eh, same items and just the the level that changes, and here instead of uh, professor uh, lector, we 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 assume the level equivalent to a professor aggregato or titular de universidad, which are equivalent, and uh, then you enter into the tenure positions. Uh, the associate research professor, uh, of course, uh, now we we we. We assume that these persons have more independence in terms of science, so, so they, they are scientifically independent. They do not depend on anybody else. They are going to have their own groups and they are going to produce the same type of items, but uh, in a more independent level. And again, we have exactly the same, the same um, criteria, but with different uh, levels. And in the full research professor, it's again the same thing. Huh? So you are supposed to provide more proposals to uh, have more proposals accepted to uh, coordinate uh, other other uh, your research groups. Uh, so that that's uh, again the same thing. More independence and of course uh, more uh, intensive activities in terms of uh, research. Huh? Of course, again, a teaching activity is listed here. Is listed here. It is not necessary, but uh, since it is an activity that many of the uh, senior researchers they do perform, even if it, they're not uh, asked explicitly to do, we are taking that into account because it also takes time. So this is uh, very much uh, the the levels, and 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 I mean uh, we want not to enter in more details, in particular, not in quantitative uh, assessment. And but what, what it's kind of interesting also is to see that apart from the university positions that uh, establish some equivalence between these positions and the uh, the, the, the say Thimner research positions and, and the university positions of lector and aggregate and titular universitat and catedratic, apart of that, uh, there are some uh, uh, competitive grants that they do also provide an, an indication of what is the level. I mean, if you get a Juan de la Fierba or the Atriu de Pinos grant, you are fulfilling, and, and that's kind of, uh, of uh, equivalent to, to have the level of assistant research professor. If you get a Ramon y Cajal or a starting grant of the DRC, then you, we assume that you have the level of associate research professor. And if you get a consolidated or, or an advanced grant of the ERC, or if uh, you get a, a NICREA research uh, professorship, then we assume that you have the level of full research professor. So also, again, just to give an idea and have reference, external reference that uh, allow you to, to, to locate these levels in a more, uh, in a more general frame. 
Okay, so this is uh, very much what I, I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, of course, I, I am open for questions. I see that there is a question somewhere. What is the period for evaluating the tenure evolution of the researcher? So, so that was uh, very much uh, in the one of the first slides. Eh? In all the slides, actually, uh, because it's, uh, I mean, this, uh, you see this uh, period here, two years from postdoctoral to the first evaluation, then another two years, then three years, then two years. In some cases, if we see people that are very mature, we may recommend advancing the second evaluation. So, and that has happened in the past. But the standard, the standard timing is the one that uh, you see here. Tienes que dar la switch displays. I don't know what does it mean. Ah. Okay, it's okay, Pedro? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you, Pedro, for, for this detailed explanation of the of the research career at, at CIMNE. Um, now I, I'm going to introduce you to Javier Ejaut Ticharro from the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. He is the coordinator of the Euraxis Spain Network and national contact point for the Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions. Today, he will talk us about the mobility actions that are implemented under the, this umbrella. And he will give us some insights about the Rebecca mentoring program for which he is also responsible uh, for Spain. Uh, Xavier, I cannot see you. Mm, ah, here you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the floor is yes because we have many people here uh, so the floor is yours thank you thank you very much thank you very much to to Thimne, first of all for 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 inviting me and also to affect the Apple, the organizers of the of the webinar for allowing us here to come in and tell our story which is a bit of an advertisement uh i'm actually going to be covering quite uh quite a number of things i believe so I'm going to have to be a little bit quick on it, uh, but you know you will have the the slides with all the links and so on, and we and you will have including our our contact information in case you want further information in any of the aspects that I'm going to be covering today. So let me see if I can pass the slides. First of all, as as uh, introduced by the organizers, I come from the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, and those of you who may have been in the Spanish uh, R&D system for a longer time might know us, especially because of our work in, in bringing science closer to society. But there's also quite a few of us who actually work in, let's say, uh, internationalization issues in support to the Ministry of Science and Innovation, because we are a foundation that belongs to the, to the ministry. And two examples of this work are actually, uh, we host what we call the Oficina Europea, the European office, which has a number of national contact points of the of the framework programs, the current uh, the current framework program Horizon Europe, and particularly those which fall under the first pillar of excellent science, which are the Maris Close Kakuri actions, and of course uh, the European Research Councils. And we are also the national coordinators of the EU Access Initiative. So I'm basically going to be building on these two on these two roles. Uh, starting from the side of the of uh, Marie Curie, just to mention that we are currently in Spain, we are three NCPs. We used to be four until a month ago, but unfortunately for us, uh, one of our colleagues, Maria, has left for new professional challenges. Uh, so currently it's uh, my colleague within Petit, Cristina Gomez, who's also the national representative in the program. We also have Jesus Rojo, who's a longtime expert in this program in the Fundación Madrid Mazde. And myself, who, let's say, I always say that I come from the Uraxa side and I engage in Marie Curie at the beginning of, uh, of Horizon Europe. So I'm the most junior, let's say, NCP. So I'm pretty sure that most of you here are aware about the existence and probably very knowledgeable about the action. So please bear with me if I say anything that it's too obvious, but just a few key messages about the, about the 
about the MSCA uh, program. And it's that it's indeed a, a, a research program. It funds, let's say, uh, uh, research, but it's also a training program. So there are a number of things which you have to keep in mind if you want to participate in an MSCA in any of the modalities. And is that there, of course, the, the starting point is always excellent research. And actually that's the interesting part, especially for researchers because it doesn't have any thematics. It's a totally bottom-up approach. It allows to, 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 to work from the proposal of the excellent science, but then you have to keep in mind several things. One of them is that it has to have a strong focus on the training of skills, on intersectoral collaborations, and also it has a very strong international uh, dimension. There are other some things which, uh, I mean, this has been basically the essence of the program since it was launched a couple of uh, framework programs back. Uh, but some things that have been uh, highlighted more that have been further strengthening in this Horizon Europe in the current uh, framework program is uh, to try to give more, more uh, a stronger gender uh, and inclusion dimension, a uh, stronger focus on dissemination and outreach. And then, of course, these things that happen in Europe, which have to do with, with, uh, with uh, science policy and try to make connections between the program and important uh, uh, European dimension policies such as the Green Deal or, or, or the transition. What uh, there are currently five modalities of Marie Curie, uh, postdoctoral fellowships, which is the one that I'm going to be talking the most because this is the, let's say the traditional, I would dare to say the traditional concept of the, of the MSCA, which is the individual postdoctoral uh, projects. But we also have doctoral networks, which at the end of the road, it's these are these are are the participants. Well, the participants is always a host organization, but here it's a collaboration of of a consortium of organizations to set up uh, innovative doctoral trainings. So at the end of the road, eventually there are positions, and I'll try to also mention in the connection with the access where you can find these options. In the case of postdoctoral fellowships, you as a researcher could. Uh, with a host organization present a proposal and doctoral networks so it would be the organizations, but then the, the positions would be at the end. In the case of staff exchange, it's also a collaboration between organizations with staffs within the, the institutions at, at, at all the different levels. And uh, with the idea of having a joint research and, and innovation project with uh, based on, on the exchange of staff between the institutions to move this, this project forward. Then we have co-fund actions, which are mono beneficiary. And basically what they do is that they co-fund either PhD well, programs to hire PhD candidates or programs to hire postdoctoral fellowships. These are no presented normally, uh, I mean, they are mono beneficiary. They are presented by a single organization. And once again, after they set up the program at the end of the road, there will be positions open for, my, for, for recruiting re researchers. And I will mention also where you can find those in connections to Marie Curie. And last but not least, we have MSCA and citizens, which are uh, actions for, for boosting public awareness of, of science and of the, of the research projects themselves. So it's not, this is the only strand of Marie Curie, which is not, let's say, a research uh, focus. It's more about communicating the results and disseminating outputs. Uh, every year we have, let's say, a full roll of, of calls of the different of the different modalities, and I'm going to focus on postdoctoral fellowships. First of all, because as I said, I think it's uh, traditionally it's the one that's more interesting, especially for the researchers. Uh, but also because they, it's the call that is going to be open just in a couple of days. So on the 12th of April, we're going to have the next postdoctoral fellowship call being open. It will remain open until until the 13th of September, and it will have a total budget of. 260, a little bit more of 260 million euros. This is a bit the timing as a reference of what, what will happen. So in April, the call will open. You will be able to present proposals until, until the 14th of, of September. And uh, with this period, uh, the evaluations would happen between October, uh, between October and December, more or less. Results would be published based on previous experience around February 2024. And then the projects after the signature of the grant agreement with the, with the European Commission would probably be starting basically from February until May, at least the first batch. Normally it's a three month, it goes in three month cycles. Nevertheless, important message here. Uh, these are always tentative of the date. So there you have one of the first links where you should check if you're interested in, in participating in this, in this call, where you should check to make sure that those are, which, which are the right dates. So in regards to postdoctoral fellowships, as I said, these are, these are 
presented by individual postdoctoral researchers uh, with, in collaboration with a host institution. The aim is that it was, it's research projects uh, fostering excellence research, but also, as I said, uh, a training, a training and, and, and career development component. It also has this triple I, which we call an MSCA, which is International Intersectoral and Interdisciplinary uh, Elements and Mobility within the, within the projects. And as I said, apart from the importance of, ha of having or trying to have non-academic sector participating in the, in the, in the projects, uh, it's also, uh, uh, it, it also aims at uh, fostering or, or strengthening the, the employability and the professional development of the researcher benefiting from the action. So as I said here, the proposals are presented with a, by a researcher, postdoctoral researcher in collaboration with a host institution. So which are the eligibility criteria from the side of the postdoctoral researcher? Uh, obviously it's a postdoctoral uh, fellowship. So you need to have a, a PhD degree or have defended the thesis at the time of the closing of the call. There's also a, a limit to experience. So it's, it's open to postdoctoral researchers with a maximum of eight years of full-time uh, employment, a uh, research experience with a number of exceptions, which sort of uh, tailor those eight years. So depending if you have been on maternal leave or countries where you still have obligatory military service or career breaks and so on, and this a calculation. So uh, depending on, on certain exceptions, which you can find in the in the website, uh, you can you can uh, these eight years. That that's how these eight years maximum is, is calculated. The other important element is what we call the mobility room. As I said, international mobility is at the heart of, of Marisco's Kakuri actions. So uh, all, actually all contracts normally apply this mobility rule, which means that you cannot have lived or worked for more than 12 months of the last 36 months in the country where you will be working as a, as a MSCA fellow. And then in terms of nationalities, it's completely, it's, uh, it's open in the case of European fellowships. There are no restrictions, although in the case of global fellowships, which are the two sub, uh, two modalities of postdoctoral fellowships that we have, and I will explain them right away. Uh, in the case of global fellowships, there are some restrictions. And then the other side, what about the host institution? Well, the host institution needs to be a, a legal entity established in a, in a European member state or a, or a Horizon Europe associated countries. Uh, MSCA in Horizon Europe is also aligned with Euratom. So in the case you can apply for an MSCA uh, postdoctoral fellowship under Euratom. And here then there would be some, some, some changes in the eligibility because what would apply is those countries which are participating in Euratom, not only Horizon Europe. Uh, it's open to academic and non-academic sector, and uh, the host institution is the beneficiary. It's, the, it's, it's who receives the, the funding to recruit the fellow. It's also the host institution who has the legal obligations, who signs the, the grant agreement with, uh, with the European Commission. And then you can put in associated partners, which can provide training, can provide services, and so on. And here's where you can include the, 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 um, the non-academic sector or you are highly encouraged to include the, the non-academic sector. As I said, European fellowships on one side, which would be more, let's say, the traditional ones, where uh, these, as I said, are open to researchers of all nationalities, again, applying the mobility. Uh, host institutions should be located in a member state or associated country. They can have a duration minimum of 12 months to 24 months, the full project. Although, uh, in order to try to foster this participation of the non-academic sector uh, in European fellowships and in global fellowships, you have the possibility of having what they call a placement, which is once you finish your, 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 uh, your traditional uh, PF, you can still have six months more as a placement than a non-academic partner, and an associated partner, which is not from, from academia. And in the case of uh, global fellowships, uh, in this case, what you have is also a host institution, which is located in an EU member state or associated country. But this uh, facilitates the possibility of doing part of the research project outside of Europe in a third country. In this case, it would be uh, an, an associated partner. And would, would the, normally, the let's say the traditional structure that you would have here is that it's a bit more of duration. It's from 24 to 36 months. And the reasons why global fellowships are longer is because you are uh, you go through an outgoing phase, which you, takes place in the third country. 
But then eventually at the end of the outgoing phase, you have the obligation of coming back to Europe, to your host institution and spending the last 12 months of, the, of, the, of, your, P, of your PF fellow in, uh, in your host institution in, in Europe. Plus the additional potential 12 months in the case of an academic placement at the end of the, at the end of the road. I'm aware that this is just very a lot of information in a minute, but what I would like to, the most important thing that I would invite you to take note if you are interested in actually applying for a PF uh, during the current call is that we are just going to be starting, uh, it was actually announced yesterday by my colleague, Christina, uh, the, the next informative sessions that we will be providing as, as NCPs. So you have there the link to our page of, of Oficina Europea and also what you, you will have the slides with the dates of the upcoming of the upcoming sessions that we will be organizing. So, okay, uh, Marie Curie is fine. As I said, your postdoctoral fellowship, you can apply. You would have to look for a host uh, institution for somebody to be your, uh, uh, to be the, uh, let's say the, the supervisor of the, of the project. And uh, you have also eventually at the end of the road of doctoral candidates and co-fund programs, the possibility of contracts. So where do I find those things? And this is where we make the connection between Marie Curie and Euraxis. Euraxis is, a, again, another initiative from the European Commission in which 42 countries participate. These 42 countries are the, the, 20, the 26 member states plus uh, associated countries to, to, to the framework program. And basically, this is a national, on one side, it's a, it's a portal, which I'm going to be focusing very much, and it's probably the part which is more, um, better known uh, to the public. But there's also, a, let's say, national structure, which are uh, the national networks, which are Eurexis people normally within institutions of the national R&D systems. So people within universities, people within, within, within uh, um, international, department, international projects departments and things like that, which have this role of Eurexis within the institutions. As an initiative, it was one of the building blocks that the commission launched in order to, to create or to make a reality of the European research area. Uh, so we started with a commitment as, a, as an initiative, very focused on supporting international mobility, uh, also to support this open labor market. And in the part of mobility, I would highlight this, this national, this national networks of service centers, which is people who try to help researchers and practical aspects that have to do with international mobility. So you get your PF, to go to Germany and then hopefully in the institution will, which will be your host institution, you will have somebody providing some kind of support for any kind of procedures for landing there in the country and so on for supporting that. But then we have the part of open labor market, which as I said, it's probably the most well known, which is basically the database of, uh, of research positions or research, uh, uh, research opportunities. Uh, and then there are two other strands. Uh, one of them, which is, has to do with institutional policies, which is trying to foster, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to foster a better management of human resources across Europe, which is done by promoting the charter and code and the way that the principles of the charter and code are implemented into research performing organizations, which is uh, through the human resources strategy for researchers. All of this is managed at the European level, but goes through the, the Eurexis platform. And then we have the most recent strand, which is trying to provide support also in career development of researchers. So mobility is the essence of, of, of field access. And then it got this increase of mandate to also try to provide support in career development uh, to the researchers. And this is actually where our Rebecca program comes in. So what, what do you find within node access jobs and within the, the database of, of jobs? Actually, we separate three kinds of offers. You have a job offer, which is, uh, let's say, a specific contract. Uh, we have a contract for two years for a postdoctoral researcher on whatever field with uh, specific conditions, with specific times of starting and specific times of ending. Then we have the funding offers, which is kind of a mixed bag. There you could have fine programs. So for example, we could announce there the FPI uh, predoctoral grants here of, uh, of the, that, that, that are open here in Spain. So here, there's not a specific contract. You just open the full program, the call. You can also find eventually some uh, other funding opportunities, for example, for mobility or, uh, or things which are not contract, like scholarships or, or stipends or things like that. And then we have the hosting offers, which is uh, initially it was built as a place where institutions could find collaborators and shared infrastructures. But then uh, they realized that it was also a very good place 
for uh, research departments and, and institutions to, for example, find candidates to prepare postdoctoral fellowships. So actually, this is there's a good tradition here in Spain about using Euraccess for that. So as of now, actually, I will show you in a slide in a minute. Uh, many departments and many research groups are actually publishing expressions of interest, finding looking for candidates to prepare postdoctoral fellowships. Then we have also information about career development resources in the program and this information that I mentioned about the, the logo and the, and the human resources strategy. So this is what the, the database of jobs looks like. This is a screenshot that I took yesterday. So you can see that there are more like more than 14,000 positions offered in the currently open of all around the world, mostly in Europe, but also more and more. We also get opportunities from other places of the, other places of the planet. And as I said, this would be a typical, this, this is what a, a job offer would look like. You have all the information, when the contract starts, what is the duration, under which project, the skills and, skills and qualifications that the candidates should have, the way to, to request uh, the position, and, and all of this, all of these things. In the case of funding, here, I would like to highlight that this is where you can find, for example, the positions which are open of a co-fund program or a doctoral network. Once the program, the, the action has been funded, they start the procedure and eventually they open the positions to recruit researchers, uh, doctoral candidates or postdoctoral, depending on the modalities. Well, doctoral networks and co-fund programs, you can find them in the, in the jobs, but also here in the funding, in the funding database. And finally, the hosting offers that I mentioned. As I said, again, this is a screenshot just from yesterday, already with the filter of Spain. So we already got 169 hosting offers from Spain published. And I haven't gone through all of them, but I'm pretty sure that 99.9% .9 of those 169 are expressions of interest looking for candidates to prepare postdoctoral, postdoctoral fellowship, uh, postdoctoral uh, proposals. And then also in the, in the, in the Euraccess portal, uh, and I'm going to speed up because I'm aware I need to finish. Uh, also, you will find the information about those who access networks. So again, I make the same analogy. You're lucky enough to find uh, through the hosting offer uh, a department or a lab, a research team, which suits your interest to prepare a postdoctoral fellowship. You present the proposal and you win it. And then you need to move. Well, as I said, in May 2024, June 2024, you need to move to another country. And uh, you could go and look for the Odexa Center, which is closest to you in order to provide, I mean, some support with, I don't know, uh, I mean, it depends, not all Odexa Centers, actually, that's an important note. I have there an example, for example, of the profile of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which has a uh, host in Odexa Center. And of course, they highlight their expertise. So it's impossible to know about everything. But here in this case, if you would be coming here, you see that they have some expertise in supporting you with the visas and entry conditions especially if you're a researcher coming from a third country, this is quite, quite interesting. And they also have a number of career development uh, uh, resources and support. So you can go and look for the Odexis, uh, uh Service Center to help you uh, with, your, with your changing from one country to the other. And I go very quickly. And then also part of the, of the national portals, I mean, of the Odexis portal, we also have a, a part which are the national portals. And there we have content which we prepare ourselves. So everything which I told you is the European portal. It's managed at the European dimension, and you can find it in the in the main portal. But then within the Spanish, we use it also to put some important information or or to complement which we with things that we think are are useful for the for the researchers. And I would just like to mention to highlight the science in Spain section, where we have currently published our career path, and you can find their information about the current positions that we have in the Spanish system in public performing research performing organizations and universities aligned with this R1, R2, R3, R4 stages, and also a list of funding uh, opportunities where there are links of the calls which are expected to offer research positions. And we also have a collaboration with the NCPs in which we try to highlight these co-fund programs which are currently ongoing and which are expected to open calls so people are aware of it. And I'm going to skip Rebecca and I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Xavier. I don't know if there's any question about um, Xavier's presentation. Anyway, we will have some space for, for Q&A later. So I think since it's, uh, all, it's already the, the time, I'm going to, well, we are going to hear in first person 
how uh, throughout a research career, there are multiple options for professional development and how it is possible to work on a profile that suits what you find closest to your preferences. Here we have a uh, Patricia for them. She's a PhD in material science and a master's in financial management. Um, she is just currently working in London. Um, that's why she was she was telling us before that uh, it's not as sunny as here. She will uh, she will also link the mentoring program of the Society of Spanish Researcher Researchers in in the UK from where she has carried out uh, these tasks as a volunteer and is also a member of the Women in Science Committee of this organization. So, Patricia. Hi, Moni. Can you hear me properly? Can you yes. see my yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, always for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me say as well, as it's a big privilege for me to be here today in this seminar about professional career under the umbrella of HR for SR. I will try to be quite good on timing uh, for two main reasons. Uh, the first one, of course, if I don't want you to get very bored about me, just giving a monologue. And the second one is just to give as much time as possible for having all the questions you may have after my presentation. I think uh, you may have read my title. Uh, the title was saying uh, the career professional career uh, your puzzle. How I see the career, the professional career, basically just to have small pieces, just to create your own puzzle. And let me take a couple of minutes just to take you through my my personal, my professional career puzzle. And you can just uh, have the, the opportunity to let me know a little bit more. As uh, Louis said, I am a PhD in material science. I got my PhD between the University of Zaragoza and the Technical University of Denmark. Originally, I'm from Zaragoza. And since I don't see your faces, uh, let me say that I'm very lucky because Zaragoza is the most beautiful uh, city in the world. And I, I guess uh, all of you agree at least with my with my statement. Uh, however, uh, before getting my PS3, uh, there was a kind of breakthrough for me, as it was the opportunity I got to be involved with some kind of industrial experiences. Uh, that happened in two different places, uh, also in two different countries. Uh, the first one was with Procter and Gamble, uh, PNG, uh, in Belgium. I don't know if you are very familiar with Procter & Gamble. Uh, PIG is a consumer uh, good company, and I'm sure if I name some of the brands, you are going to be very familiar with this company. They are uh, behind uh, Ferry, Mr. Clean, uh, Gillette, uh, just naming almost any kind of consumer good, and for sure uh, it may just belong to PIG. The other experience I got, and it was also very interesting for me, it was uh, after I completed my master in organic chemistry in Zaragoza. Uh, and it was uh, an internship. I was lucky enough uh, to be enrolled uh, with Philips in the Netherlands. At that kind of Philips model, business model is, is, is very different, but whoever just this time that is so many years back, they were mainly working with uh, these places, devices, and I was uh, just deploying some work in liquid crystalline these places. Well, uh, we have just started to build a little bit uh, our, uh, my, my puzzle with the small pieces. Uh, now you know me a little bit about my, my kind of education. Uh, I, I am queer. I'll let me just complete the other puzzle uh, that uh, you can just get a full picture of myself. Um, and just to explain that, uh, I think it's something, I don't know, I'm sure there are some PhD uh, students or uh, candidates uh, just in this presentation. 
And I think everyone who is doing a PhD, a potentially a postdoc as well, there is a moment that is a clear question that is coming to our mind. Well, what is going to be next? Now I'm going to pursue, I'm going to pursue this kind of uh, academic path that uh, Pedro was explaining extremely well, or I may just jump out and take another kind of alternative uh, just beyond uh, academia. Uh, definitely, uh, this is something, of course, is, is coming to our minds when we are doing our PhD, and as I said, potentially as well, when we are just uh, working in our postdocs. But typically, we have this concept, and at least it was even stronger before, that the natural path was just to continue in, in academia. And then the kind of, let's say, the alternative uh, path, or you know, the beyond academia was the no academic uh, role between the industry, industry, it could be science communication, just name it. But let me let me say a little bit, uh, and I will explain you what, what, uh, why, just with some data. For me, the natural path, uh, honestly, is just to move away from academia. And the kind of the alternative path is just to continue in academia. Why I am going to understand that for me clearly, and let me support my kind of statement with some data. First of all, uh, let me just bring data from the UK where I live. Uh, I think uh, they had they got an estimation that only 50% of postdocs uh, will continue in academia, 50%. That means that there are 97% that they have to find other options. Sorry, Patricia, could you repeat uh, the figures that yeah, you Yeah, it was, it was, it was 3%, three, one, two, three. 3%. Okay. That means Thanks. that 97% is almost, I will say it's almost 100, but yeah. Uh, this was data I took like three years ago. Maybe now it's a little bit more. It could be a little bit higher. It could be maybe five, but this, the, the, this is the reality. And also just uh, let me share some data from Spain. Uh, we don't have this kind of clear figure. Uh, maybe Xavier has for sure more data than I, I, I can just say. Uh, Yes, I can get, but uh, I think everyone is very familiar with Ramon Cajal, Juan de la Sierra. Uh, these, those data are back from 2019, but four years ago, I appreciate uh, the situation is, is, is better now. Uh, the numbers are, are greater. However, they are not like five, six, 10 times more than the data uh, you can see in front of, your, in front of you. Uh, there were 200 Ramon Cajal, and 225. I know you guys are very good in, in math and very good in numbers. This is a, you just uh, get it, it's less than 500 uh, people who will just get the opportunity to in America Hall or Juan de la Sierra. Uh, and again, I know Pedro was mentioning other options like we had view, we had view the Pinos uh, and as well as starting grant ERC. But uh, even with that, uh, to me, I mean, it's, it's not enough to have just allocated 100% of people who are just doing a PhD. And this is, this is the reality, and we have to be very frank with that situation. Well, uh, I was telling you that everyone is thinking uh, what to do next when uh, that person is doing a PhD and a potential. For me, there was a kind of breakthrough uh, that it was the two experiences I could get uh, during my during my education uh, with the industry. I said I was in Belgium just uh, working with PNT and as well, I was in, in the Netherlands uh, having this internship uh, with Philips. And for me, there were some kind of items of things that I started to resonate uh, with, my, with my personality maybe, with my character, and they started to feel me to make me feel very motivated. For me, I, and I, I just want to share some of them with you. Uh, one of them for sure was that I could see there were so many types of roles that you could deploy in, in, in industry, so many times. I mean, it was not only one thing you could do, it's a kind of immensely uh, option you can just uh, consider when you are just moving to industry. 
Also, um, for me, it's, it's very important, and you are going to see it later on during my presentation, was just the way you could acquire so many knowledge, very diverse type of knowledge from, I mean, supply chain, finance, anything that is just beyond maybe your kind of core uh, again, coming back uh, to my personality or my character, it's clear that I could start uh, to appreciate just the accountability when you are working in industry. When I'm saying accountability is that you have clear goals, uh, you have to achieve the goals, just to support the final objective, I mean, of maybe of your project or well, the kind of the uh, kind of the the business uh, just to have the, the business strategy of your of your company and definitely last but not least uh, you know i mean uh, industries are investing in r &D. you can name it r &D, you can name it innovation just name it as you want but they're investing in that and the clear reality is if they are not doing that uh, those companies are not going to be alive uh, in, in a kind of five, 10 years from now. And this reality is getting a little bit more dramatic lately because now, as you know, everything is changing so quickly that uh, any company that is not uh, supporting innovation, I'm sure it will be out of the, of the table in a, kind of, uh, in a kind of very, very short time. Well, I think I, I spoiled you, uh, and then uh, you know the answer uh, I got when I was thinking what to do next. And I'm sorry that uh, I didn't leave you. Yeah, when I, I posed my, that question to me, for, more, for me, it was extremely clear, 100%. I didn't want to pursue uh, my career uh, within academia. I definitely wanted to move to a uh, no academic uh, career path. Uh, just to complete, as I said, my own puzzle, and then you have a global vision of myself. I started my, my career in Spain after I completed my PhD. Uh, I work here for a chemical company, one of the largest chemical companies in the world. And I stayed there for a bunch of years, I think nearly maybe eight years. But again, I think it goes. I got these opportunities uh, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, of course, as well in Denmark. There was something in me that I mean, it was just pushing me to, to be abroad again. And lucky enough, I got a very interesting opportunity here in London. Uh, I then, I didn't think about that too much. And then I just embraced the opportunity and I moved to London back in 2016. I have been working in London for six years, a little bit more than seven years, sorry. Uh, I started in a company, the Sot Funds, that it was mainly a materials company for aerospace, aviation, automotive, for leisure market. And then uh, I decided to keep uh, growing up my career. And I took an opportunity with another company. Uh, I think I just started back in you know, December 2022. Uh, this company is D3O. Uh, D3O is a design engineering company uh, that is uh, a leader in path, uh, in path performance and in path protection. Uh, what I've been in D3O is, is last materials technical manager. And uh, well, with that, I mean, uh, I can just uh, let you know that it is the kind of my, my puzzle with the small pieces. And uh, yes, this was the part that I wanted to start talking that uh, you could have a kind of uh, an overview about my professional career. But uh, also something I want to take some time is how I have been uh, moving, uh, how, how I could just get the different opportunities. Uh, and again, it's something, I mean, it, it does work for me, or I consider these kind of things I'm going to tell you that, very, that they are very positive for me. However, it may be slightly different for you, but I mean, just let me share in case it can be something helpful and useful in your professional career. What I want to say that I mean, uh, well, there are clear attitudes you have to have in any professional career. And that to me is not only in academic careers, it's also for academic careers. 
And these, uh, this, these attitudes, they are the ones you have here in the, in the slide, and they are three for me. The three attitudes definitely is a lifelong uh, way of living, is uh, agility, the fast pace, and networking. Uh, let me just give you a kind of very short uh, opinion about the three uh, of them. Uh, thinking about agility, and, and again, uh, we're in a in a moment that everything is is extremely is is, is extremely changing uh, quite easily, and then you have to be flexible with that, extremely flexible, and you have to let yourself to adapt to the new circumstances. Yes, let me give you an example. If you are working in a company, potentially you are going to suffer an organization project and this project is going to be killed and then you have just to adjust to the new situation. If you don't have that flexibility, it may be a little bit tough for you just to, to be in this kind of uh, work environment. The second one, and again, is, is very related to, to the one I have just uh, commented, is just uh, be ready all the time. Get a very fast pace. I always say nobody is going to wait for you. Nobody is going to wait for you that you are ready. No, nobody is going to ask that you are ready. You have to be ready. And then you have to keep, I mean, having this kind of, uh, we'll say later, we'll see later, this kind of continuous learning and just to be, I mean, abreast of the kind of the last technologies or the last skills or anything like that. Just again, uh, let me emphasize that again, Nobody is going to wait for you. Nobody is going to wait for your kind of readiness of anything. And the last one uh, is networking. Well, I think when we're thinking about networking, uh, you may think, ah, yeah, this is like, I know uh, Juan who is working in company A, and maybe uh, there is a position in company A, and then it's nice. I think if I have this kind of connection with Juan, it can be very helpful for my for my career path. Or it can be, well, I saw Peter, uh, Peter, uh, I saw Peter on LinkedIn, or Peter is working in company B, amazingly. I'm going just to ask for an invitation because potentially Peter can think that uh, I am a kind of suitable candidate for, for the company. And that is fine, don't tell me wrong, that is fine. But when I'm saying networking is not in this kind of regard, for me, it's more like trying to just uh, find people that they are working in different things, that have different kind of backgrounds, they are thinking slightly or totally different from you, because uh, that is going to help you to bring kind of new ideas. And when you have new ideas, for sure, uh, you are going to have the opportunity of, of opening uh, new doors. And how to do that? How to do just to keep, I mean, this kind of three aptitudes, always, I mean, at 100%, always, I mean, just working on that. What for me, and honestly, it's not going to be any kind of breakthrough. Uh, it's not going to be rocket science. It's going to be extremely simple. For me, there are three main pillars that they are helping us uh, to this kind of continuous uh, improvement or this kind of continuous, I would say, lifelong for the three aptitudes I was mentioning before. Uh, and definitely the three pillars, they are, again, very simple, nothing new. Learning, yes, upskill, reskill, your competencies, and the last one, mentoring. And let me uh, tell you a little bit about my, my insight and of this three one. When I'm saying learning, uh, and I think it's something maybe a little bit very Spanish, if I can say that, we think that learning is, well, Learning is well. I need to get this postgraduate study, and then after this postgraduate study, I will get another one, and then another one, and then eventually you just end up with four, or five postgraduate study. <coughs> and definitely, sorry. And definitely, this is also good. I mean, I don't have anything against that. But for me, learning is just now. I mean, nowadays we have everything in our hand, everything. We have podcasts, we have books, we have internet is immense, as you know. I mean, we have anything. Uh, let me give you an example. I, I love running. And typically when I run, I use, yeah, I used to listen to some podcasts. I gave you an example here, like the, for instance, the coaching for leaders. 
it has like 1,000 episodes. There are topics I may be a little more interested. There are the ones that is not my cup of tea, but I mean, always, I mean, it's just uh, resonating in my, in my mind and it's helping me just to uh, think about, uh, about stuff I didn't have maybe opportunity uh, before. Also, I mean, reading, of course. Uh, yes, again, let me give you an example that it has been very fruitful for me. And this is the book of the Culture Map. Uh, I, I work here uh, in the UK. Uh, of course, I work with people that they are British. Uh, whoever, also I work with people from different kind of nationalities. And I have a, a team in China. That means that uh, maybe you have to keep us a deeper understanding maybe how cultural uh, how the culture can just affect maybe the way of people are behaving. And this book, I mean, is a very highly recommendation for myself. And it applies just, I think, in any kind of uh, type of uh, path or career path. And especially, of course, in academia, that, I mean, it's also a very, very, very international atmosphere. It can be a very, very good uh, help for you. Uh, the second uh, one of this kind of pillar, just to give this kind of the, the aptitudes uh, I was mentioning, just yeah, the aptitudes of uh, uh, fast pace, uh, um, fast pace very networking and agility, is just the continuous upskilling or uh, potentially reskilling your competencies. How to do that? It's very simple. I mean, it can be something that uh, it happens in your in your routine days that there is a new project or there is a new initiative, why you are not taking the opportunity just to participate in that? I'm sure you are going to uh, acquire a different type of skills that you didn't have before. It could be something maybe outside your kind of, uh, I would say, your kind of uh, uh, workplace. And this is the, the example I want to give you as well. When I came to London, I joined Spanish researchers in the UK. Uh, I started just with very tiny collaboration, but honestly, I fell in love uh, with this society. Uh, this society is a non-profit society. Basically, I think we're around 800 members uh, in the UK. And then, I, and then I, as I said, since I fell in love, I started to be more and more uh, involved with the initiatives. I was just deploying some kind of task with the Women in Science uh, department. And especially, I just uh, got the opportunity to be the director of the mentoring, of the mentoring committee. And that, believe me, uh, it was a kind of blast for me because I could just improve some of my skills and I could as well just acquire uh, new ones that I didn't have in kind of my personal uh, portfolio. And otherwise, uh, did you want to accelerate the way of uh, getting new competencies? Typically, my recommendation is just do something uh, that is totally uh, different from your kind of uh, routine or style, this kind of 180 degrees initiative. I'm going to use something I don't like it like uh, this comfort zone. I don't like this expression and this concept, but I think you are going to understand me. And then maybe just to do something outside uh, your comfort zone, it can just uh, accelerate, speed up the, the acquisition of new, new competencies. And of course, as everything in life, uh, is you cannot be just exposed uh, to a, maybe a new competency, and then you can think, well, now I am an expert. I don't need to do anything else. No, well, of course, you have to do it once. Uh, you have to analyze what you are not doing correctly, what you may have done very good, then improve it a little bit and let yourself the opportunity just to repeat it. And basically with this kind of cycle uh, is when you can just be a uh, master in your, your competencies. And the final part uh, is for me mentoring. And honestly, I'm a, a mentoring lover. Uh, and uh, let me, I think, I guess you may, you are familiar with uh, what mentoring is, but let me just, just give you maybe two comments that typically uh, they are not uh, discussed when we are talking about mentoring. For mentoring, I think clearly one of the first comments uh, I would like to express is that 
typically what I'm thinking, mentoring is amazing just for mentees. And it is. I mean, mentees can uh, get so many and important skills when they participate in a mentoring program. For instance, they can just be helped uh, maybe to improve the, his or her CV. Uh, they can be helped as well on finding uh, fellowships or, or jobs uh, as well. They can be helped in the kind of the goal settings, uh, improvement, or as well, I mean, in general, this kind of career advice or career guidance uh, that uh, the mentor can just provide to this person. But something I want to emphasize and extremely important as well, that mentors are taking a lot of profit uh, from a mentoring program. Uh, Xavier was mentioning Rebecca. Uh, I was lucky enough to participate in Rebecca and I think it was the first edition uh, as a mentor. And I have been just been a mentor for the Spanish uh, researchers in the UK mentoring program as well. Uh, potentially, I think I got like five, six different mentees alongside the, the, the mentoring program we have been having here in, in the UK. And definitely, believe me, uh, it's a way just to uh, improve uh, maybe your management and leadership uh, skills and capabilities. I'm sure you are going to get as well new kind of negotiation skills uh, without force just mentioning this kind of collaboration, networking, you are establishing uh, with, uh, with your mentee. And to me, the most important one, and frankly speaking, is just the personal satisfaction. The personal satisfaction that you someone that uh, can be uh, growing up maybe a little bit faster uh, because you are just contributing a, a little bit uh, with maybe your, your, your support to that person. That was my first comment. And the second one is always data. I know, guys, I'm sure you love data. Uh, you're working in Sydney. I'm sure you love data. And just uh, let me say that uh, mentoring is, is very positive. No, because I'm saying that, because I'm a mentoring lover. It's more because there are some kind of uh, statistic studies uh, that uh, on some surveys that they, they were done uh, related to, to mentoring. Just to mention maybe one or two, uh, one for me is, is very important that 95% of people who have been participating in a mentoring program, uh, they say they, they felt extremely motivated after, after that. 95 is a nice number, isn't it? And it's, it's good, good number for, for just considering to be in a mentoring program. And just for the one that, I mean, 96% uh, of executives uh, they say typically that the mentoring it was one of the key tools in their kind of professional career development. And just to conclude, uh, yes, uh, let me just uh, don't forget to mention something that is 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 very uh, helpful and is very crucial at least to me. And I guess sometimes we have a clear goal, and then we think this is the goal. I'm going to sprint and I'm going just uh, to achieve my goal as soon as possible. Uh, and that's it, it is the kind of thinking. And I think I did that many times in my past. Now I'm old enough and then I think I should just do that in a different way. Uh, and also let me, let me just uh, give you an example. Uh, I'm running a half marathon in London uh, this, this Sunday. As you know, half marathon is 23 kilometers, 97 meters. And when I'm going to start uh, the race this Sunday, I'm not going to think about 21 kilometers, 97 meters, not at all. What I'm going to do is just to start, well, I have to accomplish the first 10 kilometers. This is my kind of very tiny milestone. When that is completed, I will move forward and I will think about my next milestone that it will be 16 kilometers, then 18 kilometers, if my legs are behaving properly, uh, I will just uh, accomplish my goal that is just to complete the half marathon. And finally, sometimes, I mean, because we're talking about work, professional career, blah, 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 but we're human beings and we have, I mean, maybe family, friends, we have different situations, we have up and downs in our life. And don't forget that sometimes you need more time to just uh, get your milestone achieved, it's fine because sometimes maybe we have to just slow down our pace 
and then just uh, make this balance with our personal life, uh, just to to succeed uh, eventually in the in our goal accomplishment. Uh, well, this all all I wanted to share with you. Uh, again, thanks for having me here, and I am just now all fully available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Patricia, for your valuable insights. Um, for changing career. Uh, do you have any any question? Let me check. You can raise your hand uh, so that we can see it, or uh, or you can send uh, questions through the through the question and answer tool. Okay, I think it was quite clear. Um, if there are no more more questions, uh, I think that we are going to finish uh, this uh, workshop right now. Um, thank you all, everyone for your attention. I we had forty three participants, which is a uh, a, a quite good participation for for this kind of of events. Um, please uh, answer the survey that you will now uh, receive in your screens. It will take uh, only a very little time, and it's a, a very interesting feedback for us. So um, I think that's that's all. You, you have the participants. You have any other comments? Uh, if you have uh, any other comments, please let me know. Uh, Xavier? Yeah, maybe just to mention and to connect yes. with uh, the presentation of Patricia that uh, I'm sorry I couldn't speak about Rebecca, but I didn't want to steal any time. But it's a uh, very, yeah, going very now. quickly. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's a mentoring program where we try to put in contact profiles such as Patricia, so who have gone through a professional transition from academia to non academia with early stage researchers interested in exploring opportunities out there, networking and so on. It's, uh, well, I mean, we had three editions. We we're quite satisfied with the results so far. And the only thing that I wanted to mention that it's in the slides is that we will be opening. I mean, it, it works on batches. So we open a call, we make the pairs, it run for six months and then until next time. So the next edition, we hope to, it will be open on late autumn, 2023. So around November, December. So just if you be, be aware of it, that it will be coming. That's all. Don't miss the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so, well, we are going to finish right now. Thank you for your participation. And, and you will have the, the small feedback survey uh, afterwards. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.